uh, helping the committee with our inquiry. Um, we're now going to turn to our next uh, and final panel of witnesses uh, this morning. Uh, and for this session, uh, we're looking at a particular ongoing research question, if I can uh, put it uh, that way, that uh, entails questions of discovery, investigation and publication, um, uh, and that is the origin uh, of COVID-19. Uh, and to help us uh, begin uh, to ask some questions on, uh, on this, uh, we have in front of us Richard Horton, uh, who is Editor-in-Chief of The Lancet. Um, welcome back to the uh, committee, Mr Horton. Uh, we have uh, Lord Ridley, Matt Ridley, uh, who is uh, the co-author uh, of a book called Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, which was recently published, uh, and indeed his co-author, Dr. Alina Chan, uh, also uh, co-author of that book. Dr. Chan, I believe, is uh, dialing in from Boston, uh, where it is uh, very early in the morning, uh, about six o'clock in the morning, so thank you uh, for giving evidence uh, at such an early hour. Uh, perhaps I can start with a question uh, to Richard Horton. Uh, on the 18th of February, the Lancet, uh, the 18th of February 2020, crucially, uh, the Lancet published a letter um, that denounced, and I quote, conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. Uh, and there are various uh, follow-ups to that that uh, we'll go on to. But just going back to that first uh, publication of that letter. Uh, could you just talk us through the, how it came about and what was the, the process uh, behind it, how it came to your attention and what were the discussions about publishing it? Uh, Mr. Hall. Sure, thank you, um, and thank you for inviting me back. Um, and I think on that particular letter, it's worth just reiterating the title because you, you've rightly pointed to one part of the letter. But the main reason for publishing the letter lies in the title, which is statements in support of the scientists, public health professionals, and medical professionals of China combating COVID-19. And the main reason why it came to our attention, to my attention, was um, two, two reasons. First, the political context. Um, in that period in uh, late January through early February, um, there was growing criticism of China by politicians, particularly in the United States. Tom Cotton, for example, uh, a Republican, had called, uh, denounced China for being duplicitous and dishonest in its reporting of the pandemic. Um, and there were these initial claims that were being made about the possibility of an escape of the virus from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, the second part was a more public uh, context, and that is that there was growing anti-Asian sentiment. Uh, the uh, Asian American Journalists Association were reporting literally thousands of xenophobic and racist attacks against Asians. In Europe, there were actual physical attacks um, in many European countries, including the United Kingdom, against people of Asian descent because there was this narrative around the origin of the pandemic. So the purpose of publishing this letter was to really say that instead of blaming Chinese scientists or China generally, we should be offering our um, solidarity, I think is the word used in the letter, our solidarity with colleagues in China to try and get to the bottom of what this, um, of, of, what the pan of what caused the pandemic. And then the second part is what you say, which is, um, be careful about raising these speculations at this early stage because we don't have any evidence one way or the other about the possibility of a lab leak. Thank you. And um, uh, obviously this was very early in the, in the pandemic. It was the 18th of February uh, 2020. Um, how much interest was taken at the time and how much was justified given this was a letter rather than a, uh, a refereed um, journal article? Um, how much interest was paid to the author's uh, potential conflicts of interest? Well, we ask everybody who submits a piece that's accepted for publication in The Lancet to declare their competing interests. Um, and we take those statements on trust. Um, and in this particular case, uh, regrettably, uh, the authors claim that they had no competing interests. And of course, the implication of your question, as you well know, is that. Um, there were indeed 
uh, competing interests that were significant, um, particularly in relation to Peter Daszak, who is the uh, leader of the Eco Health Alliance. Thank you. And so, at the time of the 18th of February publication, uh, you weren't aware of uh, those <coughs> competing interests? We were not aware of those competing interests, but we very quickly became aware of them afterwards because he was subject to considerable public criticism um, for signing this letter but, and saying that there were um, no competing interests. And then, and then we ended up having a debate with him about, well, do you have a competing interest or not? Um, and it's quite an interesting debate to have because his view was, look, I'm an expert um, in working in China on back coronaviruses. That isn't a competing interest. It actually makes me an expert with a view that should be listened to. Our, our take was, well, that might be your view, but in the court of public opinion, um, actually, that is a competing interest you should declare. And it took us over a year to persuade him to um, declare his full competing interest, which we eventually did in June of this year. Okay. Uh, so you've explained you've got, a, uh, as it were, a self-certification, self-declaration um, model. Uh, yeah. Would it nevertheless have been reasonable for you to, to have either expected to, to know about his prospective uh, competing interests or to have inquired yourselves uh, uh, you as editor into that? Well, if we had infinite staff, then perhaps, but, you know, we're publishing every week, you know, we, we're publishing an issue per week of about 90 pages with literally hundreds of authors, and we don't uh, investigate every single author that we publish for their possible competing interests. You know, the whole, the whole process of scientific publication, and this relates to some of the issues you've been discussing in your previous two sessions, the whole process of scientific publication depends, rightly or wrongly, justly or unjustly, on an element of trust. Um, we trust authors to be honest with us, and authors trust us to deal with their work confidentially and appropriately. Um, sometimes that system breaks down. Uh, and in this particular case, um, I think Peter Daszak should certainly have declared his competing interests right at the beginning. Thank you. And um, you published an, an addendum to, to that letter of February, um, right. uh, later on the 21st of June, uh, 2021, right. I think I'm right in saying. That's right. Um, what, what precipitated that, the publication of that addendum? Well, as I mentioned, we were uh, engaged in a series of discussions with him over the previous year about what constituted a competing interest. And there was a difference of opinion between him and ourselves about that subject. But eventually, I think he, he recognized that the debate in the, as I say, the court of scientific and also public opinion was such that explaining what the nature of his relationships were with the EcoHealth Alliance and the work that they were doing in China was of material interest and of extremely important relevance to interpreting his letter of February the 18th. So I think you're, you're saying, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would I be correct to uh, interpret your response that you, you think that, with hindsight, that information uh, should have been included in the original um, 18th of February oh, letter? A hundred percent, I completely agree. The information that we published in June uh, as an addendum should definitely have been included in the uh, February 18th letter, absolutely right. Thank you. And as, you, as you've heard, we're, our investigation is into uh, research methods, integrity, publication uh, generally. Have you considered making any changes to the publication process to guard against uh, something like this uh, arising in the future? On the specific issue of competing interests? Yes. Well, we ask authors of every piece of work that is submitted to declare their competing interests. Um, have we changed our methods there? Well, as I say, it's, a, it's when we're publishing literally hundreds of authors every week, um, we don't investigate every single author ourselves. We take it on trust what they say. Um, but certainly our awareness has been heightened by this issue and I, I think certainly in the context of COVID we're now more vigilant about who we're publishing and why we're publishing and what their potential conflicts might be. Thank you and finally for me before I turn to my colleagues starting with Aaron Bell, 
Uh, on the 17th of September um, this year, uh, the Lancet published uh, a letter which uh, included an appeal for, and I quote, uh, objective, open and transparent scientific debate about the origin of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, was this the result of or a reflection of a change in editorial policy on this by the, the Lancet? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that um, what's happened between the February letter and, uh, in, in fact, we published several letters in September related to this, um, including actually for the first time letters from a letter from Chinese authors, which was really quite revealing. Um, uh, what happened was the WHO investigation, which I think was important. So in February, there was a lot of speculation about the um, validity or not of the laboratory leak hypothesis. WHO in May uh, passed a resolution to establish an independent investigatory team to go to Wuhan, to go to China, to try and understand what the possibilities were for the origins of the pandemic. Um, it took most of 2020 to put that team together, to get the team accepted by the Chinese authorities. <coughs> And then they went to China in the early part of 2021, and they published their report in March. And in their report, they identified four possible pathways for how the pandemic could begin. And for the very first time, the laboratory leak was officially endorsed by WHO as a possible, um, as a possible pathway for how the virus got into the human population. And I think after that moment in March where it got that official stamp of approval as a valid hypothesis, that opened the door um, for a much more, shall we say, transparent debate about what the scientific evidence was for and against the laboratory leak. I think until the WHO report in March, it was still highly speculative. Um, but after this visit that took place where the Wuhan laboratories were, were assessed, where there were interviews taking place with Chinese officials and scientists, um, I think that was a step change in the debate. And now, of course, you have phase two of the WHO investigation, which will be beginning very soon, to try and go a level deeper to explore those four pathways. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Horton. I'll turn to Aaron Bell and then Graeme Strip. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Horton, for coming to us again. And I remember you coming to us early in the pandemic, and you're obviously taking a strong interest. In, just, just for the record, you, you saying in your answer to the Chair that when you published that letter on the 18th of February, you had no knowledge of Dr. Dashak's links to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That's, that's absolutely correct, yes. Right. So thank you. And you said uh, in your uh, opening remarks about you know, the xenophobia and the anti-Chinese attacks and so on, and we all deplore that sort of thing, but that isn't the function of a scientific journal to, to combat that. The function of a scientific journal is presumably to illuminate the truth and, and try and get to you know, the, the true science behind things. So do you think that the publication of a letter was, you know, served those ends, or did it serve to close down the scientific debate uh, prematurely? Well, let me take two, there are two elements to your question, if I might do sure. with each of them first. Firstly, on... Um, your, the first part, the, the goal of the letter primarily was to say we have a global pandemic and the solution to a global pandemic lies in global cooperation. And that means that we should see the Chinese medical and scientific community as partners in this endeavor rather than blaming them. And what was taking place in those early weeks and months um, was a bit of a blame game which of course is still going on to some extent. And the purpose of the letter was to say, let's make common calls with our Chinese colleagues to try and get to the bottom of the origins of the pandemic. Now, in terms of the silencing effect, I, I'm certainly aware that that's been raised, but as I've mentioned, the solution to understanding the outbreak in Wuhan lay in studying what took place in Wuhan. And the World Health Organization very quickly in the early months of 2020 put together this resolution that kick-started the process of their independent investigation. There was no slowing down of that process. There was no silencing of WHO. There was no silencing of the investigation team that went to, um, that went to Wuhan. Indeed, Mr. Horton, you know, the, 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 the WHO team that went to Wuhan weren't allowed full access and they produced a report that was clearly, uh, you know, 
informed by as much as the Chinese allowed them to see. I mean, I, I applaud the idea of cooperating with China, but it's clear they haven't been open and straight with both the WHO and the wider scientific community throughout, isn't it? You're absolutely right. that They were denied access to, to, the, to raw data that they deemed materially crucial to their investigation to elucidate which of the four possibilities was most likely to be true. But what they did was they, and this, this is not unimportant, and they wrote about this recently in Nature, um, they identified the laboratory leak hypothesis as a perfectly legitimate and valid hypothesis that needed to be tested and understood. And until that point, that, that idea had been denied by the Chinese government and denied by many others. W that WHO team put it on the table and changed the terms of the debate. But, uh, well, Mr. Horton, I mean, with respect, and I'll come to our other witnesses, but the fact that the virus originated in Wuhan, which has the Wuhan Institute of Virology there, makes a prima facie, you know, Bayesian case that it's a possibility of a lab leak in the first place. And our other witnesses who've written this book said that even at the beginning, they didn't necessarily believe it was a lab leak. It was just something that needed to be considered. Did you not believe it should have even been considered in January, February 2020? Have you had to wait for the WHO to say it should be considered for you to take that position? All we had in the early part of 2020 was nothing but speculation about the possibility of a laboratory leak on the background of 20 years of understanding that many bat-related bat viruses had come through zoonotic infections. Um, and we published several commentaries in that early part of 2020 discussing the likelihood of a zoonotic um, infection. The theory was a wet market, not bats. The th the yes, but, but the intermediate host um, was proposed to be uh, one of the animals that could have been in the wet market. And if you look at Michael mm. Warraby's work, and Dr. Chan signed a letter with David Roman and others um, calling for more transparent investigations earlier this year in science, if you look at Michael Warraby's work, um, his, his conclusions, published most recently in, in science, are that the preponderance of cases in that market um, suggests that there was a critical event that took place there um, mm -hmm. that, that would lend evidence to support a zoonosis, okay. um, not a laboratory leak. Sure. I, I absolutely agree with you that these questions still remain open and demand further investigation. We, we, you say they remain open, so you clearly think the lab leak is now a credible hypothesis. Would, would you go as far to say it's a like, the likely hypothesis? What, you know, what probability would you attach to that based on your, all the knowledge that you've accumulated over this pandemic? I would agree with the WHO conclusion that it's a, it's a hypothesis that should be taken seriously and needs to be further investigated but they deemed that hypothesis extremely unlikely compared with the possibility of a zoonotic infection through an intermediate host, which they de deemed much more likely. And I think that was an entirely justifiable conclusion. And the evidence that we've had since then, at least to my reading, uh, supports that view that they expressed in March. Would you care to put a percentage on the probability of a lab leak? No, I would be happy to... Uh, agree with the WHO's view that it's extremely unlikely by comparison with a zoonotic infection. Thank you. If I could turn to our other witnesses, uh, Lord Ridley and Dr Chan. Um, th thank you for appearing before us. Dr Chan, what, what probability would you put on the possibility of there having been a lab leak uh, as, as the origin of COVID-19? I can't give the number, but that's it. Uh, you're a bit well, quiet. We'll need um, to... You're either muted or your microphone volume is very low, Dr Chan. Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes that's, that's better. better. Thank you. All right. So I think the lab origin is more likely than the natural origin at this point. We all agree that there was a critical event at the Huanan Seafood Market that was a super spreader event caused by humans. There's no evidence pointing to a natural animal origin of the virus at that market. But before I get into that, I'd like to point out that The Lancet really needs to publish all of the manuscripts it receives. Original, whether it was withdrawn or rejected by the journal, we need to see what you received from Chinese scientists in the early days of the pandemic. We know from Jeremy Farrar's work 
that the Lancet was in possession of information or human-to-human -human transmission of this virus and pre-symptomatic transmission of this virus, and, and you did not release that to the world, this could have led to many more lives saved if it could have been released to the world. So I actually came prepared with five recommendations for journals when you're dealing with issues where withholding or sharing data can be measured in the numbers Dr. of lives lost or saved. Okay, Dr. So, Chang, we, I'm sure yeah. we can come on to them, but I think through questions from our members. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And I, will, I will put that suggestion to uh, Mr. Horton later that you just made about the manuscripts, Dr. Chang. So you say more likely than not that it, it was a lab leak. Um, yeah, how confident are you that we will be able to definitively determine the origins of COVID-19 over time. I'm very confident. We've seen from previous uh, cover-ups as well that it just takes time because right now it's not safe for people who know about the origin of this pandemic to come forward. So it might be five years from now, it might be 50 years from now. But we live in an era where there's so much data being collected and stored. Everyone has a phone with cameras, with emails. Messages were flying out of Wuhan during the early days of the pandemic. We need a credible, systematic investigation to collect all of these pieces of evidence and put them together to get a much better understanding of how this pandemic might have started. Okay. I'll turn to your co-author as well. Um, Lord Ridley, what, what percentage chance would you put on the, the COVID having originated as a lab leak? You're on mute. Uh, like uh, uh, Dr Chan, I, I don't like putting a number on it, but I also think that it's now more likely than not, because we have to face the fact that after uh, two months, we knew the origin of SARS through um, uh, markets. Uh, after a couple of months, we knew the origin of MERS through camels. Uh, in this case, after two years, we still haven't found a single uh, infected animal that could be the progenitor of this uh, a pandemic. That's extremely surprising. 80,000 animals have been tested all across China. None were found in that market. Uh, and that was announced as early as May 2020. So you know, it, that was one of the things that got me uh, intrigued uh, in this possibility. And we do know of one animal that brought a closely related virus from a bat cave in southern Yunnan to specifically the city of Wuhan uh, in the years before this. And that animal is Homo sapiens, uh, in the shape of scientists. Scientists were travelling thousands of miles to, um, uh, a thousand miles or more to, to Yunnan to collect SARS-like viruses there and bring them back for experiments uh, in Wuhan. So, uh, to me, it does have to be taken seriously. And it was, it is regrettable that in 2020, uh, there was a pretty systematic attempt to, to shut down this topic. Uh, Mr. Horton says that the main purpose of that letter was to combat uh, anti-scientific, uh, sorry, anti-Chinese uh, um, conversations. That can be done while discussing the origin of the pandemic. I mean, after all, uh, whether or not it came out of a market in China or whether it came out of a laboratory in China shouldn't affect um, the position of China uh, as the source of this uh, pandemic. Thank you. And I assume you both think it was an accident that it leaked from the lab. You do, but you're both nodding. Within that, Lord Ridley, or, or, or Dr Chan, whoever, do you think it's more or less likely that the virus was modified in the lab before it escaped, I, potentially through gain-of-function research? So, uh, if I can speak to that. So, we have heard from many top virologists that a genetically engineered origin of this virus is reasonable. So, they said that it's worth investigating. And this includes virologists who have themselves made similar genetic modifications in the first SARS virus. So, we know now that this virus has a very unique uh, feature called the furin cleavage site that makes it the pandemic pathogen it is. So, without this feature, there's no way this virus would co be causing this pandemic. And only recently, in September, did a proposal get leaked showing that scientists in the US from the Eco Health Alliance were in collaboration with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, developing this pipeline for inserting novel furin cleavage sites, these genetic modifications, into novel SARS-like viruses in the lab. So what we have right now, and the analogy I use, is that you found these scientists who said in early 2018, I'm going to put horns on horses. And at the end of 2019, a unicorn shows up in their city. So it really is a striking coincidence that needs to be investigated. I'd say the burden is on scientists to show that their work did not result in the creation of SARS-CoV-2. Do you think, no. sorry, Dr. Chan, you think more sure. likely than not that the virus was modified in the lab before it leaked? 
I'm saying it has to be investigated and we okay. can investigate it because the Eco Health Alliance has these communications and documents with the Wuhan Institute of Virology that can tell us what, what was their thinking, what were the experiments they were considering, how did they come to write this proposal in 2018 saying that we're going to insert novel furin cleavage sites into novel cells like viruses in the lab. Thank you. And Laura Ridley, you wanted to come in there? Yes, I just wanted to add that this goes back to something you were discussing in an earlier session. Uh, namely, that that grant proposal to uh, the DARPA for to, to do this work um, uh, had to be leaked. We didn't know about it otherwise. It's pretty extraordinary that this information that they had been working, that they were planning to do these experiments, which are absolutely critical to the story of this question, was not revealed by Dr. Dazak. He was the principal investigator on the grant application um, until it was leaked uh, a, a couple of months ago. Um, and, you know, just going back to the questions about Dr. Dazak's role in the Lancet letter, he not only was one of the co-authors, he orchestrated it. Again, we had to find that out from leaked emails. Uh, he uh, said to his co-authors that it would not appear to be coming from him or his organization. Um, and he remained on the Lancet Commission investigating the origin of COVID for uh, many months thereafter. So uh, th there has been a significant lack of transparency, not just from the Chinese authorities, uh, but from Western ones as well in this. And that does seem to me a, a huge problem in the context of your inquiry into the importance of scientific transparency. Uh, thank you, Lord Ridley. And what would you describe as the benefits of determining the origins of COVID-19? And if it does prove to be a lab leak, what are the potential consequences both for science and western science included in that and obviously for international relations well i think that uh, we need to find out so that we can prevent the next pandemic we need to know whether or not we we should be tightening up uh, work in laboratories or whether we should be tightening up regulations relating to wildlife sales in markets at the moment we're really not doing either um, we also need to know to deter bad actors who are watching this episode and thinking that unleashing a pandemic is something they could get away with and they'd get a a pretty well Potemkin report from the World Health Organization uh, if, if it happened. Um, uh, as for the impact of finding out, if we did find out that this was a laboratory leak, obviously it would have huge implications. Uh, it, it, it would be important, I think, to um, distinguish the, you know, the enormous benefits that we do get out of biotechnology research um, uh, and uh, how much enormous good has come from that, including the vaccines that, that are helping us survive the pandemic, um, from the fact that one or two experiments seem to have been done, whether or not this was the cause, we now know that experiments were being done at biosecurity level two in Wuhan that resulted in up to 10,000 times increases in infectivity in viruses, uh, or three or four times increases in lethality in, in humanized mice. These are, these are the kinds of experiments that will play into the hands of those who are critical of science and want to stop this kind of research. So the important thing is to stop doing experiments that are risky of this kind while continuing to do ones that are less risky. And for that, we need much greater transparency across the world about what kind of gain of function experiments are being done on viruses. Thank you. Uh, if I could turn back to Mr. Horton and give you some right of reply to uh, some of the things that uh, other witnesses said. Uh, Dr. Chan challenged you to uh, publish all the manuscripts you received, including from Chinese institutions over the course of the pandemic. Are you, is, is the Lancet willing to do that, Mr. Horton? I'm not quite sure what that would uh, achieve. And normally the uh, usual practice is that the communications we have with authors are confidential. So I don't see the value of um, going back to all those authors and seeking their permission to um, request that they disclose that they submitted work to us. What, if we're talking in, about the context of um, the February letter, I think we've dealt with that directly. Um, if we're talking about the hypotheses that Dr. Chan and uh, Lord Ridley have raised about the lab leak hypothesis, they're entirely reasonable hypotheses which need to be further investigated. And I think the WHO team that has now been put together to go to Wuhan to continue those investigations, that's where we should be looking for answers. Right, thank you. And uh, Lord Ridley said that Peter Daszak remained on your, your, your commission on coronavirus for a very long period of time after you were presumably aware 
that he was extremely conflicted in writing that letter in the first place. Why was he allowed to remain on your commission? No, you're absolutely right. He did remain on the commission, um, but during the time... So we established the commission in the summer um, of 2020, and uh, it began its work towards the end of 2020. It's led by uh, Jeff Sachs, based at Columbia. Um, and when the conflict of interest that Peter Bazak had became known to us, um, and of concern to us, as we found out more, we raised this with him and the task force that we put together on COVID origins. But you said it became, um, you said it became known to you very quickly after the letter because it was immediately a, a source of you know, media interest. That's true, but we weren't aware until we'd done our own investigations the extent of that conflict. There had been a lot of discussion in social media um, and in the press about this, but we needed to know the details of exactly what, what his com alleged conflict was, um, and we were trying to get that information from him. Um, and that proved to be difficult for several months. Um, when we eventually did get that information and we raised it with him and the task force, um, then it became clear that that task force was um, not going to be able to pursue an independent inquiry into origins, and we disestablished it. So, so that's why you disestablished the task force. Um, I mean, it took 16 months for you to publish that addendum, and Dr. Chan descri has described that as too little too late, and I have to say I agree with her. Do you, do you not think it's too little well, too I late? Think, I think I explained that in answer to the Chair's earlier question. Um, when we went to Dr. Dazak to ask about this competing interest, we ended up having a, a dispute with With, him with, with, respect, with respect, Dr. Horton, we were in a fast-moving pandemic where trust in science is crucial. You can't take 16 months to resolve a basic conflict of interest that was apparent from the moment the letter was published. I completely agree that, that we needed to move fast, and we moved as fast as we could, given that this particular individual um, disagreed with us about the nature of his conflict of interest. We needed to get this information accurately described and for him to agree a text that described his relationships with the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the Eco Health Alliance and the research on back coronaviruses. We eventually extracted that and published it in June, as you've already uh, described. Um, and I, I think that we, we did a good job of correcting... I mean, when, you, when you appeared before us before, Dr. Horton, you, exp you, you expressed the need for things to move quickly in a pandemic. This has take, seems to have taken far too long. I hope Dr. Dashak will be willing to come and give evidence to this committee in future so he can explain for himself why he delayed your uh, inquiry into his conflict of interest for so long that it took 16 months. Um, but anyway, I'll leave it there and return to the chair. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Graham Stringer, then Rebecca Long Bailey. Uh, <clears throat> Matt, thanks uh, for coming this morning. Uh, I've read most of the reviews of yours and Dr. Chan's uh, book, and I've not finished the book uh, yet, but I, I've read parts of it. The reviews say, accuse you of stretching uh, facts and sensationalism. Uh, would you like to respond to that? Yes, we think that's a, a very odd characterisation of our books. Uh, we, we've had good reviews too, I should hasten to point out. But, um, <laughs> um, I wasn't going uh, to ask you to comment on the good reviews. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, um, uh, the, we were very careful in this book to uh, never put anything in that we couldn't evidence to some degree. Uh, uh, I, every now and then, would write a paragraph of speculation saying, well, maybe they were doing this and that or something. And Alina would be very strict and say, sorry, that paragraph has to come out. We've got no evidence for it. So every, you know, there's about a third, of, no, no, sorry, a fifth of the book consists of references. Um, we back up every statement we make. We give both hypotheses equal time in the book. At the end, we have a chapter where we um, hand the microphone, as it were, to a, a lawyer to make the case to the jury that it was the market where it began. Um, and I find that chapter quite persuasive when I reread it. Uh, and we then hand the microphone to a lawyer to make the opposite case. And again, I find that quite persuasive. So we think we're very fair on both hypotheses. And the one thing we don't do is go into speculation about bioweapons, about um, the political aspects of things. Just to give a specific example, there is a 
report from inside the US intelligence community that three of the first cases were workers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology who got sick in November 2019 with symptoms very like COVID-19. And there's some very specific details attaching to that. We mention that, but say quite clearly that because we don't have uh, security level clearance, we can't check that whether that's true or not. Um, so we're, we're very clear what we can confirm what we can't, uh, and actually the book is rigorously factual and the very opposite of uh, sensationalist. If um, the scientific debate had been operating in the way I think all of us would wish, in an open, transparent, uh, quick, speedy way, would there have been any need to write this book? No, frankly. Uh, um, I think uh, the... The, the motivation to write it that was driving Dr. Chan and me was the fact that it was very clear that we didn't know the answer to where this came from. And that was because of a lot of efforts to obscure details. You know, the changing of the names of viruses, the, the giving of no reference to where, where it was found, things like that, at the, right at the beginning. Uh, so that it took several months to uncover the the source of RATG13, the most closely related virus at that time to um, SARS-CoV-2. All of these um, uh, obscurings were, I think, a red rag to our bull. We wanted to try and find out what was going on. Um, uh, and we'd much rather be in a situation where it had become very clear very early on what and people had been invited in to investigate all of the details and rule out the laboratory, rule out the market, whichever. You know, there's a database at the Wuhan Institute of Virology with 22,000 entries in it, uh, 15,000 of them relate to viruses from bats. Uh, it's been offline since before the pandemic. It was there to help prepare for pandemics. Which pandemic are they waiting for before they <laughs> share it with the rest of the world? Quite a lot of the entries in it were um, relate to viruses that were collected with US government funding through the EcoHealth Alliance. Why don't they have access to that data? Again, going back to your earlier session about the importance of making data available. So, Dr. Chan, I've, I've read that um, co-authoring this book has led to some personal difficulties to you and, and, and threats. Is that the case? And if it is, can you tell us uh, what has happened? It is true that's the case, but I don't think that it's good to get into detail about this because it distracts from the matter at hand. So I'd rather spend the remaining time talking about why it's important to get those original manuscripts. Sorry, this is very important to me and actually should be the first priority of an investigation into the origin of COVID-19. So we know that lots of scientists inside of China were sending out information in the form of manuscripts in the early days of this pandemic, not just to The Lancet, but to many other prominent prestigious journals, some of whom the editors are here today. And so we need to see those. We need to know what scientists knew, what they were sharing in the beginning, before the gag order went down, before they started withdrawing their papers, before they started altering their papers. This will really help us to fill out the picture of what was happening. Great. I, I appreciate uh, that, but part of science working is that science, scientists have to have uh, freedom of thought and freedom of uh, movement. I mean, it, it seems to me from what I've read that there are attempts to restrict your uh, freedoms. Is that, is that the case? I'd say that that is the case for a lot of scientists who are handling COVID-19 issues. So this is so controversial that anything, like just masks, vaccines, where the virus is airborne, even just very basic things like that, not to mention the origin of COVID-19, will result in threats coming at scientists. So it's it's unavoidable. I'm not saying that's right, but I, I would say I, I don't, I'm not in a rare situation. <laughs> a lot of scientists have suffered a lot of abuse. Uh, but I'd say that in, in this situation specifically, there are potential career uh, effects. So for a scientist to come out and say something that the rest of the community doesn't want to talk about, that has condemned as a conspiracy theory since early 2020 that has said that anyone raising the possibility of a lab origin is anti-scientific, is racist, is a right-winger. That's crazy. This is a scientific problem and it cannot become a policy where we can only investigate lab-based outbreaks in uh, white countries. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Holden, I was surprised uh, at 
your answers to, to my colleague Aaron when you said that uh, once the World Health Organization had uh, said that the lab leak theory was a possibility, then that in somehow validated uh, that hypothesis. Why do we need the World Health Organization, which is a highly political organization as well as uh, being a sort of a health organization, why is that needed to validate a hypothesis? I think what it did was it was the it was the result of the first independent investigation into what took place in Wuhan. For all of its imperfections, for all of its inability to get at raw material that it it's, it, it has said that it needs further access to, but it was the first time that an official independent investigation had put the laboratory leak hypothesis on the table. And up to that point, there had been a lot of debate, a lot of speculation about this, but I do think that was a turning point in placing that hypothesis as a serious contender with three others for further investigation. Um, and I just would like to, um, I, I do understand the, um, the charge that Chinese scientists might have been gagged in, in some of their discussions of this. But one of the letters that we published in September of, uh, of this year um, was from a group of Chinese scientists, in fact, including the president of the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. Um, and that letter <coughs> said that although the, they, they argue that the laboratory leak hypothesis was extremely unlikely, but they don't 100% rule it out. Um, and they say that there needs to be international cooperation to properly understand the origins of the pandemic. So within the political constraints that, that Chinese scientists live with, there is an acknowledgement that there's, there is an area of uncertainty here that needs to be investigated. Um, and that comes from some of the highest echelons within Chinese science. Um, and, and that's why the WHO phase two investigation then becomes so important. Again, in answer to questions that Aaron asked, you said that you had to trust uh, your contributors both on conflict of interest. Was nothing learnt about trust uh, in The Lancet from the experience with Wakefield and the MMR autism uh, hypothesis when it took 12 years to uh, withdraw a fraudulent paper? Well, I think that one of the lessons there was that we do need to have independent scrutiny when allegations of misconduct are made. There needs to be a proper due process where those investigations can take place. Um, so that's one of the lessons that we drew from that whole uh, case that you mentioned. Um, I'm not sure how relevant it is to the Peter Daszak competing interest issue here. It's relevant in terms of how you assess uh, papers that, you, that are put forward or letters that are put forward to the Lancet because you seem to say, well, we have to trust what's uh, put forward. This is from the beginning, partly because it is China and their political system has been an area of uh, controversy. So just to accept it on the basis of trust, uh, particularly given the, the trust you put into the Wakefield paper, I think, is a, I, I think it requires some justification. No, I, mean, I think your question is reasonable, um, given that Peter Daszak had those connections with uh, the Eco Health Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, but as I say, um, the edifice of science, um, rightly or wrongly, um, does depend to a large degree on trust. When papers are submitted to us for peer review, we take it on trust that the description of research that has been presented to us is an accurate description of what took place. We don't go back to that institution and check the raw data. We don't look at the primary records. We don't look at the case reports of randomized trials to make sure that all of those data are indeed true. We, we take it on trust that that information is correct. Um, now, 
if, if you're arguing that that is a, a step too far, that we should be investigating, uh, that, then that, that does require a radical change in our publication system. Um, I hope that we have enough confidence overall in the institutions of science that we can agree that episodes of outright research fraud are relatively uncommon and don't require such a regulatory bureaucracy that would impede science um, and the speed with which science delivers important answers. Okay. Thank Sorry, you. I could jump in. Um, I think that there's too briefly. much trust, and this trust is being exploited by sometimes bad actors. I'm sorry, I missed that, Dr. Chen. Just repeat what you said. I think that it, it's great that journals are so trusting, but sometimes in these times of crisis, these, this trust is being exploited by bad actors to shape the narrative, to by shut down actors. discourse, to send out fake data, to, to mislead people into thinking this doesn't spread amongst humans. Like, this is crazy. Like, we, we cannot trust everything in times of crisis. So I'm going to say that about the WHO as well. Let's be clear about how they decided whether the lab leak was likely or not. They went into a room where there were Chinese government officials and they all asked the scientists at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, did you do this? And they said, no, we didn't. And then they voted. They voted to see how likely you think this is in front of Chinese government officials. What do you think the response would be? Who would say that we think a lab leak is likely? So let's be clear, this was not a scientific process. Right. Um, our inquiry is um, on the publication practices of journals and the, and the, uh, the way that scientific research is conducted. Um, uh, and in this respect, The Lancet, of course, is an important scientific journal. And so um, we've got some questions relating uh, to the role of The Lancet as a scientific journal, uh, relating to some of the questions that were asked to our earlier witnesses. And Rebecca Long-Bailey is going to ask some of those. Thank you, and thank you all for speaking to us today. Um, my questions are to Richard. Um, firstly, what role is The Lancet currently playing in ensuring transparency in research? Thank you. Um, well, I think the, uh, what we're trying to do in terms of broader issues of supporting research integrity, of which, of which transparency is a very important part, um, <coughs> extends from, for example, in the peer review process, we require review, we ask reviewers to review not just the paper, the five page essay that you heard about earlier, uh, but also the protocol. Uh, that goes with the paper, which is, of course, a considerably larger document, together with the statistical analysis plan, so that there's a much fuller understanding of the nature of the study. Um, we, of course, have moved into the area of preprints, um, and we have our own preprint server um, that tries to encourage that early publication of work, and of course, that's been extremely important in the, uh, during the pandemic so that journals um, are, are not justifiably accused of sitting on work for a long period of time before it's in the public domain, so people can have access to an early version of it. Um, so that improves transparency. The whole open access movement, of course, has been extremely important in improving transparency, and certainly at the Lancet over the last few years, we've launched a range of open access journals to try and improve transparency um, and access to information. I think on the broader issue, and this was important, this was raised, um, I think, by um, Ben earlier. Um, I do think that the methods of science um, have to some degree outstripped the way journals work. Um, because in the old days, I mean, going back 30 years or so, you could get published in a journal with a two by two uh, table, very simple epidemiology. Um, and that doesn't work in the same way now. You often have these very complex models, um, computational statistics, um, which are actually very difficult to reproduce. Um, and that's where journals, I think, do struggle um, to make that information transparent and where we have to work with institutions so that, that they provide that information independently of journals. I think in terms of, um, in terms of rigor, for us, at a, at a clinical journal, we're trying to publish studies, um, particularly in the clinical trial arena, um, which uh, don't suffer from high levels of random error. So large, simple trials can reduce the risk of mistakes. And if you go back again 20 years or so, many of the early studies 
Um, early randomized trials were often small, um, single center studies that raised many false positives, and we've tried to learn lessons from that. Thanks, that's really helpful. How easily can the data underpinning a research paper be made available on your platform? And, and how do you address, there was a problem raised earlier about how peer review never takes place on the software that's used to collate a piece of research. How would you propose trying to overcome that in a journal? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a problem we're, we're struggling with right now. Um, and I don't, I don't have a simple answer that I can give you because it's a, it's a current challenge. Um, but let, let, me give you, let me give you a very live example at the moment um, uh, with Omicron. So uh, last Friday, I was discussing with a particular modeling group in the United States um, how, we could, um, how we could model the, and forecast the pandemic globally, um, factoring in Omicron. Um, and the answer to that question is that um, you've got to factor in uh, infection-related immunity, vaccine-mediated immunity, waning immunity, and the severity of the disease. And several of those areas we just simply have no data on. And I asked the, the person I was talking to, well, tell me the, what are the mechanics of the model that you've got? How, how are you putting this model together? Um, and the complexity is just enormous because you've got 194 countries um, you're trying to get data from those countries on the extent of the pandemic, often subnational data. You're trying to put that into a computational model um, with the four variables that I've just mentioned, which are overlaid on de Delta, which is, has been the previous dominant variant. I mean, the complexity is enormous. And how do you make that transparent and reproducible for another independent research group. And I don't have an answer to that question because um, those data are not fully available to everybody to see. And I think all modeling groups are struggling with this at the moment, making those data available for independent scrutiny and independent validation. So it's a, it's a struggle. And I think this is, this is my point that I made just a moment ago, that in a sense, the science, particularly the modeling science, is outstripping um, some of the mechanisms we have for independent validation and transparency. Thank you, can, that's can really helpful. Jump in? Sorry, Dr. Chan. Can I quickly jump in? So scientific journals can do a lot to help research integrity. So I don't know why everyone here is running out of ideas, but I have some really good ones for you. So make preprints mandatory prior to submission. That way everyone can see it. Check that all data is deposited on international databases that cannot be altered by the submitters later. We've seen this happen with COVID-19. Sequences were deleted off an international database. Journals can do this. You can just check it. So <laughs> publish peer reviews. You can keep it anonymous, but make it open so that people can see if there's gatekeeping or bias. Refuse to publish papers when novel pathogen sequences have not been shared in databases for more than a year after discovery. So don't publish any more work where they are hiding pathogen sequences for years and years. Uh, incentivize replication studies, timely publication of submissions that correctly call out errors in papers. So these steps will immediately help the research community quickly see when there are errors in papers, when data is missing, when there are incorrect sample histories. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, perhaps, Mr. Horden, you might just give a response to some of those uh, suggestions um, that Dr. Chan has given. No, I think they're, they're extremely constructive suggestions. I mean, in the world that I work in, which is um, medicine and global health, um, the issue about making all data available immediately on publication can be a little challenging because um, oftentimes data is provided by governments under confidentiality clauses to researchers and it's not within the power of researchers to make those data um, publicly available. Um, so that can, that can and, and we've run into problems with that in the past, where we've um, had a request that an organization provides data um, for independent scrutiny by another research group, and the authors will tell us that they are um, contractually unable to share that information. So I think it's an aspiration, it's an ideal that we should certainly be working to, but the reality of, unfortunately, doing international collaborations is that there are sometimes contractual details that prevent that. 
Thank you. Is it time for a very quick comment? Yeah, of course, uh, Lord Ridley. Just to give an example of, of the system working well uh, in this case, uh, there was a paper published uh, which was submitted before the pandemic began, but published after it began, by the EcoHealth Alliance, Latin et al., and it was a summary of 630 uh, coronaviruses that had been studied up until 2015 by the group. <clears throat> now, what was interesting was that they uploaded all of the genome sequences, uh, well, the, the partial genome sequences, into an international genetic database. And this enabled two citizen scientists, Francisco Rivera and an anonymous person called Barbar Lelephant, to uh, identify in June of 2020 that there were eight viruses very closely related to SARS-CoV-2 within that sample that had been collected from the same site in Mojiang, where the most closely related one had come from, uh, and which were being held at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It took another six months before the existence of those eight viruses was confirmed by the Wuhan Institute of Virology in their addendum to the Nature paper. So don't neglect the, role, the, the, the importance of individual citizen scientists going out and doing the, 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 the dirty work of finding out what's in these databases. Thank you, Lord Ridley. That's a very good point. Uh, this uh, committee uh, is followed by many citizen scientists uh, in the country, and, uh, and no doubt they will have uh, heard that call to arms, um, which I'm sure the committee will endorse. Uh, just finally from, uh, from me on this point of uh, publication, before I turn finally to Catherine Fletcher, uh, my colleague, um, I don't know whether you heard um, uh, Dr Moylan in the previous session, uh, Mr Horton, um, refer to publication practices, and um, she made a, an argument that I was surprised by, that a, the journals are as likely to publish um, confirmatory studies uh, as, as it were, sort of breaking news. Does that apply to The Lancet and its stable of publications? Yes, I heard that. Um, I would, look, let's, let's take a very specific example. Um, so we had the opportunity to publish the very first AstraZeneca vaccine trial, I think in December 2020. Um, now, if we then receive the fifth randomized trial looking at the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, would we have published that in The Lancet? And the answer, honestly, is very unlikely. Um, the qu what we are asking <coughs> is, is the, is the paper asking and trying to answer a scientific or clinical question that is important? And, if the, if the, uh, and that means that it could be the first study, like the AstraZeneca paper, um, or let's say there's a dis there have been several papers, let's say there have been several papers on AstraZeneca and they've come to slightly different conclusions or they've raised other questions, um, then maybe we would have published the fifth trial if, this, if there was a scientific or clinical question that was important. But for a general medical journal, of course, we are making judgments all the time about what's important and what isn't important. Um, and to say that we're publishing absolutely everything that sounds science, well, clearly we're not. Um, we have to make choices. You know, on the front of The Lancet, um, you know, we still have a print copy, amazingly, um, it says that we're a newspaper, and we've been a newspaper for 200 years. We're just a very specialized newspaper. And just like newspapers have to choose what they think are the most important stories for their readership. So we are making judgments about what we think are the most important areas of science for our readers. Um, that requires judgment. Um, I hope we get it right most of the time. Sometimes we get it wrong. Um, but that's what a journal does. We're not, a, we're not an, electronic, uh, an electronic database that publishes everything. We are a journal with a specific community who we are trying to serve. So um, we do make judgments and we do make choices. Well, th that would th that conforms to my expectation. You've got to attract interest to uh, to your journal, which is why I was surprised by that piece of evidence. But do you recognise the, the the kind of structural problem that some of our earlier witnesses pointed to that that it may be socially beneficial, uh, if I could put it that way, 
uh, for people literally just to to reproduce uh, and to to validate uh, conclusions that someone else has drawn, and if the research design and the integrity behind it has all been, as we would hope, proper, then actually you wouldn't find anything terribly interesting per se, and that will put people off who, especially early career researchers, want to have some articles in prestigious journals. That, that, there's a structural problem there, is there not? Uh, there, is, there is a problem, and I think what publishers have tried to do, I, I can only speak really for the Lancet group of journals, we've got over 20 journals at the Lancet, so let's, let's take, let me take my AstraZeneca example again. Um, so the first trial comes to the Lancet, we publish it. Um, let's say there are subsequent trials, um, but they'll be very interesting, perhaps not to a general audience, but they'll be very interested to a specialist audience. So we have, a, we have an infectious disease version of The Lancet. Um, and so what we will do is we ask the authors, would you consider publishing in The Lancet Infectious Diseases? And if they say yes, then it gets published there, um, subject to peer review. So um, we try and transfer papers across The Lancet journals so that they are appropriate for a particular audience. Peer review isn't wasted. The peer reviews we might have done at the weekly are then used for our other journals. Um, and that way, I think we can have an efficient means of not falling into the trap that you rightly described, because there's an enormous amount of waste in the system. And I think what publishers have to do is figure out how to reduce that waste. And we've got one solution, um, and it works pretty well for us. Um, but I absolutely acknowledge the, the challenge that you're drawing attention to. Thank you very much, Dietz. Uh, Catherine Fletcher, finally, in the session. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this inquiry is about the integrity of research and what we can do to make sure that we have the gold standard. And I think listening to what's been an incredibly helpful session, thank you so much for, for all of our witnesses, two questions still remain open for me. And I think to draw a conclusion, I'd like to just ask witnesses both of them. The first one is, in times of crisis, is the current process um, uh, you know, speedy enough to allow for... Um, uh, to allow for information to be made available prior to, uh, should somebody want to get a th set of thumb screws out, uh, is it you know it, is it possible for information to come out before the thumb screws do? So that's question one for me, and question two for me is you you know uh, Mr. Horton, thank you. You mentioned off the bus the lessons learned from the Wakefield. Um, MMR situation, that independent scrutiny is really important, that concerns are raised. Is, my question to you is, is the research integrity permeable to a concerted volume-based effort to obfuscate scientific research? So, so, so almost, you know, like in the internet where you get distributed denial of service attacks where everybody just tries to load the website that falls over. Is the current research integrity system liable to that kind of that approach should somebody want to um, break the system's integrity. So if I maybe start with that second one first and then I'll come to Lord Ridley and Dr Chan. Are, are, are you, can you be obfuscated by volume in these times of crisis? Mr Horton. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a great question. Um, and I can tell you from the volume point of view, it was a huge, you know, everybody rightly taught, and this is much more important, the, uh, the stress on the National Health Service um, in the past 18 months. Um, if you look at numbers of papers submitted to Lancet journals, they went up by factors of five or six. Um, and we certainly struggled to have resilient systems. Uh, so that's a, it's a, it's a very fair concern. Um, However, however, um, I do think um, that the, uh, the broader, especially social media, does act as a very valuable um, corrective um, on what journals do um, and holds us accountable for our decisions in a very useful way. So let me give you a, a, a very good example. That, the, that. The, the answer to that question does require social media to be available and free of use. And given we're talking about COVID-19, I, I might ask you to just, especially as we're slightly over time, just stick to the should 
was there a risk that COVID-19 research, especially in the early days, was obfuscated by volume? And does that special time perhaps make a special case to at least, even if we have to redact it, share the volume that you were receiving at that time and the source yeah. of the volume? Well, I, I mean, having lived through it, I can tell you we were certainly challenged by the volume, but I don't think we were obfuscated by the volume. Um, I think that our teams worked incredibly hard to try and sift out what was important and what was less important um, to publish. So uh, it was difficult, um, but I, I think for the most part we did a pretty good job. Um, no, that, that's fair enough. Uh, maybe I'd ask the same question of Dr Chan or uh, Lord Ridley. Dr Chan. Yes, we've seen that happen. So when there are groups that are incentivized to pro promote a particular narrative, they, they can swarm the publication system. So one very clear example of this was the Pangolin Papers. So all of a sudden <coughs> in February, there were four Pangolin Papers just put online at once and published in prestigious journals. One was even solicited by a prestigious journal. Uh, so I'd say that that fueled the, the media speculation and public speculation that this virus had come from a natural origin, from a pangolin. Meanwhile, there was a paper that showed that there was no pangolin or bat sold in Wuhan markets between 2017 and end of 2019. That was kept under peer review, rejected from a journal, not shared. And so there is a lot of power in these journals to withhold and obscure so, information, so Dr. Chan whether is, intentionally is, or not. So Dr Chan, is that the basis of your point, which is you need to know the full list, not just what got published? Yes, and that's why I think journals should mandate pre-printing before submission. Everything needs to be put openly before submission, not like the day that they are accepted or when they are revision. We want to see the original manuscripts. We want to see who wrote it, whether the data is available. That, that was a very interesting point you made in quite a long list. I hope you will write that list to the committee. Um, because yes, I, I my, my note taking wasn't to keep up, wasn't uh, to speed. Um, uh, Lord Ridley, uh, just uh, can we be obfuscated in our scientific endeavours? Well, can, can I address your first question about speed um, uh, before that, if that's all right? Um, the, 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 the pandemic did show that we could accelerate the scientific publishing process so as to get results out quickly. And the, the Zhu et al. paper that came out uh, preprint in January, but publication on the 3rd of February, I think it was, which was the first sequence of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 genome and a comparison with the nearest bat sequence very important to get it out, et cetera, et cetera. It had problems. It left out crucial bits of information, as we later found out. Um, but uh, the, the point was that correcting the bad information ought to have been as quick as the original publications. And that's where the system fell down. So we got lots of stuff rushed into print, which was then found to be inadequate. The Pangolin Papers is another good example. Dr. Chan wrote some very trenchant critiques of the Pangolin papers, the inadequacy of their data, the duplication of their, their work and so on. And that got stuck in peer review for many months. So uh, I think what, what we need is for a conversation to happen within the scientific uh, literature much faster. Um, yes, somebody push, rushes something into print, but yes, a rebuttal uh, appears relatively quickly after that as well. That's what I'm saying. Thank you all for your time. I do mean it. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Just perhaps finally uh, to me to uh, Richard Horton. Um, talking about um, speed and, um, and the, the volume uh, of papers uh, being produced, uh, it just hasn't um, escaped anyone's attention that uh, Omicron um, is a subject uh, of intense national interest. Just describe to me wh what you're receiving in terms of research papers and how you're going about making decisions to, uh, to, to print and to accept uh, papers uh, there. And given, we particularly know because of the, the speed of transition of this virus is, is thought to be very rapid, it, it underlines especially some of the points that my colleagues have been making about speed. So to, to tell us as the, uh, the editor-in-chief yeah. of The Lancet what you're doing about this. Okay. Um... Well, first of all, uh, in recent days, there have been some quite frightening numbers that have come out of modeling groups in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, I understand that those numbers are the best that the groups can produce at the moment. But 
I also understand that there are critically important missing bits of information that, with, and without that information, it's very, very difficult to have reliable forecasts for likely numbers of infections and hospitalizations and deaths, because we just don't have reliable information on severity. Now, um, I, we are in touch with groups in South Africa, which probably have some of the most reliable information at the moment about that. Um, we have seen some early data on severity. That information is being written up, um, and I hope that it will be submitted to, to us soon. Um, but we haven't received it at the moment. I expect that we'll be getting it within the next, I hope, one to two weeks. Um, let's say that that information is successfully reviewed and published, so that will then be perhaps in the next three to four weeks. They might pre present that as a preprint to Dr. Chan's point. Um, so we will have this information, I think, before the holiday, um, and then we can plug that into the models so that we'll have a much better estimate of where we stand with Omicron um, before the end of the year. But right now, um, we really don't have that rigorous and reliable information. And the, on the basis of the numbers that I've seen from South Africa so far, still they're relatively small numbers. Um, so again, they're going to come with an uncertainty interval um, which should give us a little bit of pause um, before we um, are confident. So this, this, this policy at the moment of planning for the worst and hoping for the best, um, I know it seems extreme, but based on the data that I've seen so far, um, that does seem quite a wise policy at the moment until we get better information. And reflecting on finally on what was um, said about uh, publishing the the whole volume of submissions that you've had for publication, given that it, it, even accepting papers as as preprints involves a degree of, uh, of scrutiny analysis, which takes time. Um, have you considered? Will you consider publishing as a as a platform, as a as a web platform, if not uh, obviously in physical form? what yeah. you receive over the days ahead so that you referred to social media earlier the you know, yeah. uh, the the armchair um scientists can at least yeah. see the the data even if they don't, they don't have no, particular expertise i understand so for for uh, about a year or so now we had a preprint server um, and what we do when an author submits a paper to any of the lancet journals we give them the option so we don't mandate it this is Dr. Chan's point, we should mandate it. We don't mandate it, but we give authors an option on the moment that they submit their paper to a Lancet journal that they can have it uploaded on a preprint server so that it's completely visible to everybody. Um, and that promotes transparency, it promotes accountability, and people can see the original document as written by the authors. Um, now, that's a, that's a pretty... I think that is, that is going some way to what Dr. Chan and what yourself um, are alluding to. Uh, you may then come back to me and challenge me, well, why don't you mandate it? Um, and the reason why we don't mandate it is that we, we think that authors should have the right to decide about whether their work is in the public domain or not pre-peer review. Because sometimes in the health field, they might have findings which are extremely sensitive and controversial, and they just simply don't want to have that work available yet until it's gone through some validation process. Um, and the authors have the right to decide that rather than we as editors having the right to decide it. But I accept that this is an issue for discussion. Absolutely. Well, you make a very clear case as to why uh, there might be a reason that people want, want to have some sort of uh, review before they're associated with it permanently. Um, it's been a fascinating um, uh, session, a fascinating conversation, both on the general aspects and the particular aspects of the origins uh, of COVID. Very grateful to Richard Horton, uh, to Laura Ridley, and to Dr. Chan for appearing uh, before us today. This concludes this session uh, of the committee, although our inquiry into research integrity and reproducibility continues. Order, order. The proceeding has ended.